So our final presentation uh, will be from uh, Manu Prakash and the Octopi team. So I will pass it on to you. My name is Manu. Uh, first of all, thank you for having all of us. I wish you could support hundreds and hundreds of inventors and people around the world. I mean, this is very important. And I think uh, you know we get a chance to participate. But I think the things that will trickle out of this program will be phenomenal. Uh, I run a lab at Stanford uh, thinking about frugal science, and today I'm going to talk about Octopi, uh, which is a modular instrument, a kind of you can think of it as a big brother of Foldscope uh, for high throughput imaging, and very specifically for malaria and many other things. And two of the graduate students, Hong Chuan and Ethan, uh, just absolutely incredible builders, are here. We'll be running demos. Francois couldn't join us because he's biking in East Africa across five countries uh, for a whole month, talking to primary healthcare workers along the way. Uh, Hazel, who's a biochemist, and a couple other machine learning folks that are involved. Uh, so let's begin from the very beginning. Can you all hear me at the back? Or I see. Um, I'll speak louder. Uh, let's begin from the, how many of you have had malaria? Come on, one. Uh, two, you are a population in the world uh, that have not had to worry about an incredibly dangerous uh, thing that's hanging on people's lives. Uh, so if we're going to talk about history, uh, let's talk about history from the very beginning. Half a billion years ago, malaria was an algae. It was living in a pond, having its own life, had nothing to do with parasites. Around 150 million ago, years ago, the ancestors of mosquitoes evolved and evolved to live in it. 130 million years ago, it had the double lifestyle. Uh, around the same time, it essentially started devastating bird populations. You might not know this. Of course, malaria kills humans, but malaria is absolutely exterminating a massive number of bird species around the world as well. Uh, we go back to five million years ago. This was a very important event. Falciparum evolved. We will talk about falciparum quite a lot. It's the deadliest malaria parasite out there. Uh, a week of it having it and no treatment uh, is a death sentence. Uh, around 10,000 years ago, a lethal strain evolved. And around 5,000 years ago, anophelines, which are the mosquito that cause and transmit malaria, actually decided that humans are yummy. <coughs> and they're gonna focus on humans, which is, again, a really terrible thing. So going back with all that history, present day, we have 220 million cases around the world. 220 million cases around the world every year, and in this room, uh, there are two, so you can start thinking about the context of this problem. Uh, around 450,000 deaths every year, malaria has killed more people than any war in human history combined all the deaths of all the diseases combined. And so this is the type of toll that a disease like this has had. Uh, half of the world's population is at risk. That's probably not in this room. Uh, and our response to this has been incredible. Three billion years, three billion dollars three, uh, are spent trying to fight this disease itself. And still, this is where we are. And a lot of optimistic in the room uh, sort of tell me and talk about this idea of eliminating malaria. Uh, last year's data, we have had more cases of malaria in the last two years than previous years. We had the slow gains, uh, which were fantastic with bed nets and all the drugs that were coming into the market. It's going backwards. So this is not just a disease that has been there for the past, but it's actually rising. And one way of thinking about this is a picture that I took in Tororo that uh, reminds me of this is a, one of the field sites we work in that Ethan just got back from. This site has the highest probability if you were here, you would get malaria. Kids here would get malaria five times a year. And when I took this picture, I was playing with these kids. There was a pregnant mother, and my interpreter asked me this, oh, did you realize what they're sitting on? And I don't know if you've realized what is in that picture. That's graves of their brothers and sisters, and this is the reality that we live in. For a problem that we've had a solution, we have a drug for malaria that you could take a couple of times and you'll be cured. But who out of these kids would I give the drug to? That's the challenge that we've been trying to tackle. Uh, one of the problems with malaria has been the gold standard is microscopy. <laughs> the test that we do, this is me in Kalahandi, which is a terrorist area in India, uh, which has tremendous malaria that's underreported. Uh, this is Durga and Prem. And one of the things that they're doing, they're doing nonstop, they're essentially robots. They'll spend half an hour to one hour per case 
And if you notice very carefully, there will be people coming by that window knocking on his shoulder, hey, is my case done? Uh, and they will do this 10 hours a day, continuously, and they can handle maybe 20 or so patients. Uh, but we're talking about hundreds of patients showing up even at primary health centers. The test that they are doing is literally invented by Mr. Gimsa in around 1904. And that test has still is the gold standard, the best test that's out there. So we wanted to change that. And one of the things we started thinking about is this tool called Octopi. It's called Octopi because it doesn't have tentacles, uh, but it's completely modular, it's reconfigurable, and has multiple heads. So the microscope reconfigures based on uh, the sets of parts, computational modules, and imaging modules. Uh, but it is a little robot. Uh, we released this tool uh, this year as an open source, and all the files and much of the data is online. Uh, but we built it for a cost of around $250. So the competitor in the field that's out there for being able to do something in an automated manner costs around $100,000. Uh, that's literally 40 octopi around the world operating from a disease context. And one of the things is you will see a demo downstairs. This is what it looks like. It's operating on a cell phone charger. Uh, I just put a blood smear. Uh, and at this point, it's turned on. It's autofocusing. It's scanning. And one of the things that this tool is doing, which is different from microscopy, it's actually doing spectroscopy per spot. So rather than just looking at light being emitted by these individual parasites, we're actually looking at the color emitted by those sets of spots. And we use that for uh, identification. Uh, why can we do this? Why is this possible? So, I mean, some people said the 1970s was awesome. No, today is awesome, <laughs> or awesomer. Uh, 1997, the best supercomputer that you could buy was around a teraflop per second. Today, right now, the NVIDIA drivers that we use to do onboard image processing and AI on these tools that require no internet connection is around six teraflops per second, and that costs around $300. I mean, the computing revolution we have had is just mind-boggling, and I'm just talking about the best supercomputer in 1997. <laughs> the other thing, on the imaging sensor side, because you are all fascinated by taking pictures at night, the quantum efficiency of imaging <laughs> sensors have skyrocketed. It's to a point where Starvis is one of the Sony's technologies, allows us to give, for a couple of bucks, very high quantum efficiency, low dark current, perfect for fluorescence microscopy. And of course, you all know about deep learning and all the AI. It's very important that much of the work that we do and all the deep learning happens on board. So this as a tool is in the middle of nowhere, doesn't require internet, and doesn't require power. Very important. So this is what we've been able to do. We can scan uh, around 2 million cells per second, uh, sorry, per minute. Uh, that would be good. Uh, uh, <laughs> And the power of that is within a five minute or so, we can actually do a malaria test. And this is essentially a picture from Bovindi. You can see the line that's piling up. Uh, this is the set of data. This collects uh, these gigapixel images that then are individual parasites associated with patients. Uh, we built this tool. Uh, we published it. And of course, the first step things that we do is go out to the field. So that's Francois and Ethan just got back. Francois just caught up with him. Uh, at this point, there are roughly around seven or so octopi operating around the world. Uh, I deployed one in uh, Kalahandi, which is the highest malaria spot. And literally on WhatsApp, we get data from uh, the users that we've been using and training out in the hospital itself. Uh, so now uh, this is uh, sort of clinical trials going on for validation studies. We got our Uganda data back, and that is very exciting. Uh, this is a movie, so let me see uh, if it's going to play. What you're seeing is a real patient sample. And uh, this is what my meant by what we were able to discover is you have to do half the work with hardware and half the work with biochemistry. Uh, if you notice, the color of these spots change from green to blue. Green are parasites, and blue are platelets and other uh, blood cells that also have DNA. And Rather than, uh, you know, if you were to think about, rather than choosing optics that's very expensive, we're using spectroscopy and a trick that we discovered, uh, the biochemical trick that discovers that allows to separate uh, spectrally these parasites. Uh, 
what do we, where do we go from here? One of the big things that we are trying to do is to build uh, the first robotic network of micros microscopes. Uh, we call it the Open Diagnostics Network. And this has a ring that's very familiar to most of you who know what we did with Foldscope. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, there is roughly around 25 partners that we have that we are building and deploying these tools uh, to be able to scale up both validation. Of course, all the, uh, the tool is open source itself. Many of these are engineering partners, including schools and universities in Africa itself where the burden of the disease is the highest. Uh, and uh, one of the things I want to mention is offshoots of what happens when you make a tool and you share with somebody uh, is we built this tool and immediately TB came to our target. And we adapted and just built a different head that's specific to TB. So this is live TB data where we have now a dye, half the work being done by chemistry, half the work with hardware, to be able to detect how many live pathogens are there in a smear of a TB patient done with the Bertozzi lab. Uh, there is another uh, group that we're working with to actually build the open TB test for uh, gene signatures. And another instrument that we have built on top of Octopi, which is a Raman spectroscopy based that allows us to test for sepsis. Uh, uh, the other aspect of this is, of course, people do all kinds of things. There is a large number of groups that are actually using this from an environmental sampling and ecology perspective, and we call those groups uh, citizen scientists because they're really focused on the ocean. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here. I think uh, I want to emphasize how important a program like this, and again, you know, I've been making these tools for a while, uh, to be able to legitimize the value of sharing scientific tools with people in an open-ended way where I have no idea where this tool would go. And actually, frankly, every inventor, if you honestly ask them, lasers and most of those classic examples, we somehow pretend that these sets of applications are bundled up. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, at this point, I'm happy to report, since Kumar got it up, we crossed last month a uh, one million mark for full scope communities, and I cannot tell you the number of applications that people have built these tools around. And what they continue to do every day inspires us, and actually, I mean, this has been one of the motivations to do that for medical science itself. Uh, and then uh, we will demo some of these tools. Uh, I will not advise you to prick your finger, but if anybody was bleeding accidentally, we'll happy to look at your blood. Thank you.